more than any other tank of World War II, the German Tiger tank, with its almost impenetrable armor and highly accurate 88 mm gun, instilled fear in the hearts of Allied soldiers. It killed two of my crew, and I was literally blown out of the top. Outnumbered in nearly every battle, the highly trained and courageous Tiger crews were the elite of Germany's crack panzer troops. It was a great thing to be in a Tiger. And of course, we felt superior. Using archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations enters the world of one of the finest armored vehicles in the history of tank warfare, the Tiger tank. In 1916, the British Army was the first to introduce tanks on the battlefield. At the time, Germany showed little or no interest in the revolutionary new tank. After their defeat in World War I, however, many German officers became convinced that when Germany rose again, the tank would play a major role. The Treaty of Versailles had banned all armament production in post-war Germany. Early development of German tanks during the 1920s and 30s had to be carried out in secret. But once Hitler and the Nazis came to power, all pretense of secrecy was thrown aside. Germany had built its army into a mighty fighting machine that would conquer almost the entire continent of Europe. Large tank formations, known as panzer divisions, were to be its main striking force. General Heinz Guderian, one of the leading strategists in the German army, created Germany's panzer divisions. His ideas on the deployment and use of tanks in modern warfare earned him the title, Father of the Panzers. Heinz Guderian studied armored warfare between World War I and World War II and was able to take rather nebulous ideas and condense them down into a formal doctrine. Armies operate on doctrine, and Guderian is the father of armored warfare doctrine. During this period, the acknowledged leader in the principles of mechanization was British tank pioneer Major General John Fuller. Fuller was an eccentric genius whose ideas on tanks and mechanization earned him an international reputation, particularly in Germany. My father's role model was Fuller. He also studied other people's ideas on tanks. But the British already had, at the beginning of the 1920s, a tank brigade, which we based our army's panzer divisions on. So it was the British who were his main role model. Ironically, Major General Fuller's ideas were never adopted by either the British, French or the Americans, who all believed in the supremacy of infantry and artillery rather than the tank. General Guderian, however, clearly appreciated the decisive role that armored divisions would play in future conflicts. He saw tanks as providing crucial mobility in an attack. He developed the use of tanks as the main weapon in a division. Not like the French, who spread their tanks over several divisions instead of concentrating them in one key point. With this concept of key point concentration in panzer divisions, we entered the war and had our success. Hitler's panzer divisions were put to the test in 1939 when they spearheaded the German invasion of Poland. Enemy resistance collapsed within six weeks. Then the following year, the Germans turned west to attack the British and French. The superior tactics of the panzers just sliced through the enemy lines with almost laughable ease, despite the fact that the Allies had more tanks.
In June 1941, Hitler again unleashed his panzers, this time on the Soviet Union. Within weeks, the Red Army was pushed back to the gates of Moscow. The victorious panzer division seemed indestructible. They considered their tanks superior to anything the enemy could produce. But in the autumn of 1941, the Germans were taken by complete surprise when the Russians deployed a new tank. Developed in great secrecy, the Russian T-34 outgunned and outperformed the German panzers. Soon the T-34 appeared. And that was an amazing surprise for us, because we didn't know that this vehicle existed. The T-34 turned out to be an equal opponent indeed, and we struggled quite a bit against it. The first appearance of the T-34 had not only inflicted severe losses on the German tanks, it deeply shocked the high command. They knew that once the T-34 went into mass production, defeat would be a very real possibility. Hitler was furious at this setback. He ordered his designers to build a bigger and better tank that would level the playing field. Hitler became personally involved in setting out the specifications, which included a high-velocity gun, thick armor, at a top speed of 30 miles an hour. Early prototypes of this new tank, designated the Panzer Mark VI, were quickly built by established German companies. Mann, Daimler-Benz, Henschel and Porsche. By 1942, only two frontrunners were left in the race, Porsche and Henschel. Both companies prepared a demonstration of their tanks on Hitler's birthday, April the 20th. Dr. Ferdinand Porsche was a personal friend of the Führer, so it was annoying for both of them to discover the Henschel design was clearly better. Of the three basic characteristics of any tank, firepower, armor, and mobility, the German designers favored firepower. So in response to Hitler's directive, Henschel decided upon a turret and an 88mm gun designed by Krupp, the German steel manufacturers. Two months later, the new super tank was finally ready for combat trials. To match its performance, it was named the Tiger. At 56 tons, the Tiger was nearly 20 tons heavier than its nearest rival. Yet despite its size, it had to be able to cross difficult terrain and negotiate obstacles better than any Allied tank. Adolf Hitler was in love with the Tiger tank. It was big and it was powerful and it fit the ideal of the Nazi Superman. So this, this vehicle epitomized the German army and Germany in that it was big and it was powerful. In late 1942, frontline units received their new wonder weapon, equipped with the most lethal tank gun in existence, the 88 millimeter. It would not take long to discover if the Tiger proved to be the battle-winning tank that Hitler badly wanted. The incredible triumphs of the German army during the first three years of war had shown the Panzer divisions to be Hitler's best shock troops. The panzer spirit of determination, cunning and cool-bloodedness had ensured rapid victory on the battlefield. Panzer generals such as Erwin Rommel and Heinz Guderian had become legendary figures. Along with the fighter pilot, the panzer trooper in his dashing black uniform and death's head badges was Germany's new superhero. Alfred Rubel was eager to join the Panzers when war broke out in 1939. 
The panzers were seen as elite troops in the army, which was expressed simply through our black uniform. We were certainly proud. We were young men, after all. When the Tiger tank was first introduced in 1942, only the best crews were selected. They were the elite of the elite. Crews for the Tiger were recruited exclusively from experienced soldiers who had already served in other tank units during the war. Our training commenced with theory in the lecture hall, followed soon afterwards with practical on the actual machine. Instructors explained the Tiger's advanced technology, using pamphlets about the care and maintenance each trooper was expected to carry out. The five-man crew trained together, familiarizing themselves with the tank until they understood every aspect of their new weapon. They particularly welcomed the superior protection the Tiger offered its crews. With nearly four inches of frontal and over three inches of side and rear armor, it was the world's most heavily armored tank. My first impression, I was disappointed. It was a dinosaur, not an elegant vehicle as I had imagined. I expected it to be like the T-34. However, when we got to know and learn how to apply its power, it became the superior tank on any battlefield to the end of the war. German tank designers were always searching for a bigger and better gun capable of dealing with enemy tanks. The 88mm gun was superior to any other gun at that time. So was the technology for targeting the gun, with the turret turning mechanism. The gunner stood with his foot on two rockers. If he pressed his foot forwards, the turret would turn to the right. And if he pressed it backward, it would turn to the left. In training, gunners and loaders were timed with a stopwatch and only passed if they completed their tasks within the set number of seconds. Some of the top crews were even trained by Luftwaffe instructors, experts on the 88mm gun. The radio operator sat next to the driver and manned the forward machine gun located in a ball mounting on the offside of the front armor plate. The machine guns were used primarily to fight off enemy infantry and anti-tank guns that were very close keeping their crew's heads down. Tiger tank drivers were selected with great care. You need a certain degree of ambition to drive the thing, a certain level of technical understanding and some intelligence. Some people were afraid and claustrophobic in the tank, but you couldn't have that. The driver had to be calm, which had a positive effect on the rest of the crew. The Tiger had eight forward and four reverse gears, but its huge weight made steering difficult, so Henschel developed power steering, and for the first time a steering wheel instead of levers was used to maneuver a tank. Because of the power of steering, you could basically steer the Tiger with one finger, and the half-automatic gear shift was also much better than any other tank that we had. The initial role for the heavy Tiger tank was to be the iron fist of the Panzer divisions, punching a hole in the enemy lines. A Panzer division, the cornerstone of German strategy, usually consisted of a Panzer regiment, about 200 tanks, divided into three battalions. Each division had two Panzer grenadier regiments, highly trained infantry, to support the tanks. In addition, there were artillery, engineers, anti-aircraft guns, and numerous support troops. The total number of men varied from 10 to 15,000, depending on the campaign. 
Tiger tanks were usually grouped into heavy companies and attached to divisions. Each fighting company had 14 Tigers. And then in each company, we had vehicles for maintenance troops, company vehicles for logistics, fuel provisions, ammunition supply, food, and so on. Fuel is the lifeblood of tanks. And with the Tiger consuming two and a half gallons per mile, the all-important fuel trucks were never far away. The Tiger is an engineering marvel. The vulnerability, though, is not the tank. It's everything that goes with it. It's the, the ammunition truck. It's the, the fuel browser that goes along with this. You attack that, the tank is, is useless. Tiger units often included light and medium tanks, such as the Mark III's and IV's. These tanks were needed to perform numerous duties for which the Tiger was not suited, like scouting and escort duties. This left the Tiger to do what it did best, destroying the enemy at long range. The Tiger tank, with its highly trained crews, soon became a legend. Its sheer size and appearance, together with its large, deadly gun, was about to make the Tiger a battle winner. The first Tiger tanks, with their highly trained crews, made their debut in action on the Russian front in late 1942. The well-trained Panzer divisions found Russia to be ideal tank country. However, the logistics of maneuvering large formations across the great distances of the Russian plains or steppe meant crews were often confined to their tanks for long periods, sometimes even days. Our tank wasn't only a combat weapon, accommodation and means of transport. It was our home, and accordingly the tank was maintained and cared for. Tiger crews especially benefited from the tank's large interior. In the Tiger, the driver and radio operator in particular had a lot of space for themselves. There were comfortable seats, and I was able to stretch out if I wanted to sleep. The driver could do the same. Other tanks just couldn't compare. When in action, Tigers had the advantage of being able to engage and destroy enemy tanks, like the T-34, at long range. We could now hit targets from a distance we had only dreamt of before. The tank commander would announce the target, and the gunner would choose for himself when to open fire. Only bad commanders interfered with the gunner until he actually opened fire. An encounter with a Tiger on the battlefield was a daunting prospect for the Russian T-34 crews. You did get a little shiver when you met a Tiger tank. Not only because it was so powerful, but because we were young and this tank was frightening. It was more powerful than the T-34. Our 76 mm guns could only fire at a distance of 500 meters. But a Tiger could shoot from a distance of one kilometer without missing. So this made it very hard for us. Even if the T-34s got close enough, the Tiger's armor proved very effective. In my first battle in a Tiger, we were exposed on the Russian steppe and took so many hits, but to no effect. I developed such a sense of security at the time and thought, with this vehicle, nothing can happen to me at all. We felt quite safe in our tank, although it wasn't a life insurance. I was wounded five times despite the Tiger. But we could withstand an attack much better now. We had tanks that were hit 30 times by Russian guns and still in working order. 
In one six-hour engagement, a tiger was hit 227 times. Despite having its wheels, tracks, and transmission damaged, it managed to crawl a further 40 miles across country. Tigers worked in conjunction with infantry and artillery, each element supporting the other. Panzer grenadier machine gun teams were deployed on the flanks, up to 50 yards from the tank, in case of enemy infantry attacks. Tiger commanders had excellent radio communications with their crews. I know from my own experience that you never looked out with the headphones on both ears, but always kept one ear free. If you don't hear what's happening outside, then you are exposed to enemy attack without being able to react appropriately. It is most important for the commander to have an overview of the battlefield. With a well-trained crew, the Tiger commander concentrated on searching for targets, always preferring to keep his hatch open. I had to have my head outside of the turret so that I could oversee everything. If there was an anti-tank gun firing, you could then sense what was going on. If the hatch was closed, then you would only have a limited view. Tiger Ace Otto Karius, seen here wearing the Knight's Cross for bravery, is credited with destroying over 100 Allied tanks. A dangerous yet essential tactic for a commander was to make a reconnaissance on foot. From ground level, he would gain a more realistic picture of where tactically to place the heavy Tiger. On one occasion, Carius, observing enemy tanks from a Panzer Grenadier trench, was caught in a surprise infantry assault. The Russian machine gun fire was very heavy, and I was shot through the thigh, and I was unable to run back through the trench. Carius sent his orderly back for help as the Russian infantry reached his trench. I got a bullet in my arm and another through my back. I could hear my own tanks coming. But the Russian officer was nervous. He could see I was a highly decorated commander and saw my maps and wanted to take me alive. But he realized it was too late for that and shot me again, which went through my neck. And then my tanks arrived. Although Otto Karius sustained five serious wounds, he recovered and returned to the battlefront nine months later. The SS Panzer divisions were also equipped with Tiger tanks. Although not strictly part of the army, the Waffen SS were elite troops, politically indoctrinated into the Nazi cause. Their reputation for bravery as well as brutality made the SS Panzer regiments amongst the most feared of all German troops. In June 1944, two battle-hardened SS Panzer divisions, armed with Tiger tanks, were ordered from the Russian front to France, where the long-awaited Second Front had begun. Their mission? To destroy the Anglo-American forces in Normandy. In June 1944, two panzer divisions armed with the mighty Tiger tank were dispatched to Normandy. For months, the Germans had been expecting an Allied invasion of France. What they didn't know was exactly when and where it would come. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, commander of the anti-invasion forces, had strengthened the coastal defenses. But the use of the panzer divisions armed with the superior Tiger tank had been a point of contention between the top commanders. Field Marshal von Rundstedt, the supreme commander in the West, had clearly laid down the role of the Panzer divisions in the defense of France. The main force would be kept well back from the coast and used to plug any gaps once the exact location of the invasion was known. 
But Rommel's ideas were different. He argued the panzers must be kept as near to the beaches as possible, so an Allied landing could be repulsed immediately. Hitler intervened in the argument and reserved the right to deploy the panzers himself. Unfortunately for Rommel, the panzers were not used to repulse the Allied landings. Incredibly, Hitler was unavailable to order their use. By the time they eventually did arrive, they were too late. The Allied beachhead was already established. The two SS panzer divisions transferred from the Russian front, however, went into action, immediately deploying their Tiger tanks against the Allies. It was a terrifying experience for those that met them because they could knock our tanks out at a thousand yards, whereas we couldn't even knock them out at 200 yards if we met them head on. The destructive capability of the Tiger tank on the battlefield became legendary, and Allied soldiers soon coined the term Tiger phobia. General Montgomery actually banned British combat reports that recorded the prowess of Tiger tanks on the grounds they undermined morale. Ironically, despite the perception by Allied troops that the SS Panzers fielded hundreds of Tigers, only 90 actually fought in Normandy. But the damage they inflicted on the Allies confirmed the reputation of the Tiger. The most impressive exploit achieved by a Tiger unit in Normandy took place on the 13th of June, 1944, seven days after D-Day. That morning, several British tanks were advancing out of the French town of Villa Bocage. The long, narrow road forced them to travel in single file with their headquarter vehicles in the center. Unknown to the British, a group of five Tiger tanks under the command of SS Lieutenant Michael Whitman, were hiding nearby. Whitman was a battle-hardened Tiger ace who had destroyed 117 enemy tanks on the Russian front to win his Knight's Cross. Dispersing his other tanks to different strategic points, Whitman's Tiger entered the town. Catching the British by surprise, he destroyed three tanks before maneuvering his Tiger into a position to attack the British column from the rear. And then through the smoke, suddenly emerged this huge tank. It moved its gun very slightly and fired. It was a crash, and the shell went through the front of the tank. Between my legs, I could feel a tingling each side, so I know it must have gone between my legs, and landed up in the engine. So the sheet of flame came over the tank, so I shouted bail out to the crew because it wouldn't be very long before the ammunition exploded. Within two minutes, Whitman's tank had left 13 British vehicles burning in the road. Menacingly, the Tiger now headed towards the tank commanded by Captain Pat Dias. I fired at a Tiger at 100 yards, and the shot just bounced off which is a bit disheartening. Dias managed to reverse his tank into a garden out of sight as Whitman passed by. He then decided to ambush Whitman from behind, but before he could fire, the tiger had turned. We met head on, which was not good news. And I fired at him twice, unless before they bounced off, and he then fired at me once, which did not bounce off. It killed two of my crew, and I was literally blown out of the top. Eight more SS Tigers reinforced Whitman, and the battle raged. Finally, his Tiger was knocked out, but he escaped, leaving Villa Bocage a scene of death and destruction. Despite losing four Tigers, Whitman had destroyed 47 Allied vehicles, and inflicted 257 casualties. Pat Dias's heroic attempt to stop Whitman's Tiger had left him wounded 
and nearly blind. Luckily, the doctor who treated him at the first aid station was an eye specialist. He put a great big magnet over my eyes and brrr, brrr, and out jumped all the little bits of steel. And he said, if those had stayed in for 24 hours, you would have been blind for life. The encounter at Villa Bocage had demonstrated, despite overwhelming odds, how lethal a well-commanded tiger could be in close quarter combat. Vitman himself, I could not but admire him. He was tough, he was bold and ruthless. A fine example of a German tank man. Eight weeks after Villa Bocage, Michael Whitman was killed when his tiger was ambushed by a British tank. Although the initial D-Day landings had been a success, fanatical German resistance had stopped the Allied advance. The Tiger was proving itself very effective in defense. Its long-range gun and thick armor proved unforgiving. The tiger was best avoided, really. You couldn't really do anything against them. It felt quite powerless. It's like a, night, like a nightmare, you know, where things get a little bit nasty and a little bit nasty and a little bit nasty, and then, my God, it is a tiger. And call on the radio, so there's a tiger, and give a map reference, and then the, the RAF would come very quickly and the typhoons and rocket it. On July the 18th, 1944, Operation Goodwood was launched as the first phase of the Allied breakout in Normandy. The plan was to blast a path with heavy bombers to allow three Allied armored divisions to push forward. 1,500 bombers of the Royal Air Force staged the biggest air raid of the war against German tank positions. Lieutenant Richard von Rosen and his Tiger crew were waiting in well-entrenched positions when they heard the RAF Pathfinder planes overhead. They flew over us and continued dropping these flares. Then I knew it was going to get ugly. Although what was going to happen at that stage, I couldn't even imagine. I saw the tank next to me, meters away, and was burning severely. It had been sliced open like a sardine can, hit right through. Our courage was somewhat diminished. We'd never seen anything like it. You have to imagine what we experienced in our tank during these two and a half hours of carpet bombing. It was hell. By late August, all German resistance in Normandy collapsed. The German 7th Army lost a quarter of a million men and thousands of tons of material. Despite its success, the landscape of Normandy had not allowed the Tiger tanks to be used to their full potential. The, the Tiger probably made a difference on the Eastern Front, where the Germans faced a target-rich environment, and it's good tank country. When you get it into an area where it's closed, like a city or a lot of places in, in Western Europe, where the terrain is closed down and you can't see 2,000 meters, it loses a lot of effectiveness in that, it doesn't have the feels of fire that it would have in Russia. Despite his empire collapsing around him, Adolf Hitler still pursued his dream of a bigger and better tank. Incredibly, at this late stage in the war, the Third Reich found the resources to produce the even more powerful King Tiger. Hitler would use this super tank in a daring last minute gamble to turn the tide of the war.
By late 1944, the German armies were in retreat on all fronts. But Hitler believed that the new King Tiger tank would give his panzer divisions the winning edge on the battlefield. Five years of war had seen his panzers sustain enormous losses in material, which even the efficient German armaments industry found difficult to replace. Once the United States and the Soviet Union had entered the war, German tank production could not compete. The Americans alone produced four times as many tanks as Germany. The Soviet Union produced more than 40,000 T-34s during the course of the war. But Hitler was obsessed with super heavy tanks. He believed that superior weapons were the key to victory. They were, however, expensive. A Tiger tank took 300,000 man hours to build at a cost of 800,000 Reichmarks, the same as three fighter planes. To solve their manpower problems, the Nazis staffed their factories with enforced labor. This actually hampered German mass production as it took far longer to build the sophisticated Tiger tank, with many needless man hours being wasted. Whereas the American Sherman and the Russian T-34 tanks were far more suited to mass production by relatively unskilled workers. The new King Tiger was introduced onto the battlefield in late 1944. At 70 tons, it would be the largest tank in service during World War II. Its long-barreled gun could deal with any tank with apparent ease. Panzer Commander Richard von Rosen is seen here inspecting his battle group of King Tigers. The King Tiger had a similar shape to the T-34. It had sloping armor, not the square shape of the Tiger I. In the West, the enemy tanks didn't give us a headache, neither the Sherman or the bigger version, the Firefly, with its bigger gun. None of this was a problem for us. The Ardennes counter-offensive, known as the Battle of the Bulge, began on the 16th of December, 1944. It is the one battle of the war most closely linked with the King Tiger tank. Hitler ordered 10 panzer and 14 infantry divisions to break through the Ardennes forest in Belgium, seize the port of Antwerp, and sever the Allied supply line to their northern armies. One King Tiger battalion was placed in an SS battle group spearheading the advance. Using the poor weather to their advantage, the German troops completely surprised the Americans, throwing them back in disarray within the first few days. A German breakthrough looked imminent. Although the Germans only deployed about 150 King Tigers, their reputation completely outweighed the impact of their numbers. Initially, during the Battle of the Bulge, when the King Tiger was used against American troops, it, it, it panicked them. Uh, they never seen anything that big. So they were caught completely by surprise. Here they are supposed to be in a quiet front. The next thing you know, they have this monstrous, huge King Tiger rolling down on top of them. And it shocked them. It was hard to recover from this initial panic. But the Germans soon discovered they had made a tactical blunder in using King Tigers, despite its lethal killing power, to spearhead the offensive. Because of its size, the King Tiger was not suited to rapid maneuvering through the narrow roads of the hilly and heavily wooded terrain of the Ardennes. They're operating in mud and slush, snow. And because it was so huge, the German engineers would have to build special bridges for it and raft these things across. The, the attack bogged down. When the SS tank crews ran out of fuel and ammunition, they were forced to fight their way out on foot after first destroying their own King Tigers rather than see them captured. The desperate nature of the fighting experienced in the Ardennes counteroffensive 
became evident in one incident when 77 unarmed American prisoners were brutally massacred by the SS near Malmedy. After the war, 80 former SS soldiers were prosecuted for murder. The Germans sought to maintain the initiative by redeploying their remaining King Tigers to the town of Bastogne, which had been surrounded earlier in the offensive. But here, determined American resistance prevented Bastogne from falling. A hard battle was fought for this strategic position, but even the King Tigers could not turn the tide. As the weather improved, Allied air superiority decimated the German armor, including the precious King Tigers. With the defeat of Hitler's Arden Gamble, the last great Tiger action in the West had been fought and lost. Germany's defeat was now just weeks away. The few Tigers remaining in Hitler's diminishing arsenal were used mainly on the Eastern Front. The war was lost. Everybody knew that. We only wanted to keep the Russians as far away as possible from the German border. That was our motivation. During the final two years of the war, the Panzer troops had fought with distinction through the great battles on both East and West fronts. Their skill and discipline in defense, often against overwhelming odds, had pushed the Allies to the limit. People tend to underestimate how good the Germans were, and they also thereby underestimate how good we were. Throughout its operational life, the Tiger tank was rushed to every crisis, and its crews fought on every front. Its performance in battle became legendary. Damals, uh... I wouldn't have wanted to go into battle in any other tank but the Tiger, because it was superior in every aspect to every other tank we had. The Tiger was, for me, the best tank that existed. It had its flaws, which you got to know, but you could live with that. Life in a Tiger crew, commanding a Tiger company, was, for me, the highlight of my time as a soldier. The Germans were unable to produce such an advanced weapon in the numbers needed to save the Third Reich. Yet even with the defeat of Nazi Germany, the reputation of the Tiger endures. During World War II, the Tiger tank is absolutely superior to the American M4 Sherman or the Russian T-34. But in the end, they only made 1,300 of them. And overall, that's a drop in the bucket. But, having said that, the tank's going to go down in military history as one of the great tanks of all time.